schizophrenia is a condition that is found in every culture. People suffering from schizophrenia have a reduced fecundity rate. That is, they have fewer children compared to the general population. And, and this creates the paradox why the condition still exists. Hi, I'm Adam Hunt, and this is the Evolving Psychiatry Podcast, rethinking mental health through an evolutionary lens. Share it with the people who matter, like it if you like it, subscribe if you want to hear more. Professor Martin Bruner is head of the Division of Cognitive Neuropsychiatry and Psychiatric Preventative Medicine at the LWL University Hospital, Ruhr University, Bochum, Germany. He's authored more than 300 articles and book chapters across a range of topics, including many on evolutionary psychiatry. He also authored the textbook of evolutionary psychiatry and psychosomatic medicine, The Origins of Psychopathology, published by OUP. And he co-edited the Oxford Handbook of Evolutionary Medicine, with um, Wolf Schievenhovel, uh, also published by OUP in 2019. And these are both excellent resources, uh, really, really great um, standout resources in the field. Um, perhaps before the publication of the book we're discussing today, they were they were the kind of foundational texts. So thank you, Martin, for those. Uh, thank you. He, he is a particular expert in borderline personality disorder and also schizophrenia spectrum disorders. Uh, and evolutionary approaches to these conditions, of course. And today he's talking about schizophrenia um, and about his chapter, uh, Evolutionary Perspectives on Schizophrenia Spectrum Disorders. Uh, so thank you, Martin, for joining me. Um, thank you, Adam. So, so you start by mentioning the big evolutionary question around schizophrenia, um, the paradox of its existence. So could you just briefly explain what this is and, and why schizophrenia in particular is, is so paradoxical. Yeah, thanks, Adam, for your kind introduction. Um, yeah, the paradox is actually about the discrepancy between uh, prevalence of the condition uh, worldwide and the um, reproductive fecundity of people affected by the condition uh, we call schizophrenia. Mm. It seems to be the case that uh, schizophrenia is uh, a condition that is found in every culture, probably not at the same uh, prevalence rate, which is uh, one of the uh, dogmas about schizophrenia that is still around, that there is a worldwide 1% prevalence rate, which is probably incorrect, but it's right. found in yeah. uh, every ethnicity. And on the other hand, we know, at least from Western populations, that um, people suffering from schizophrenia have a um, reduced fecundity rate. That is, they have fewer children compared to the general population. And, and this creates the paradox why the condition still exists and has not been um, eliminated, so to speak, by selective processes. And we still don't know why it is. Right. So we'd expect that anything that's genetic and heritable should be selected out by evolution. Yes. Um, and and it and it's, schizophrenia seems extremely harmful and yet it persists everywhere we see it. So so what's going on? Like what, why has this happened? And to a lesser extent, this is a paradox about most mental disorders, especially early onset ones. But schizophrenia is particularly paradoxical because it's so harmful for fitness, right? And you point out that males have something like a 50% reduced fecundity. Um exactly. So, so our job as evolutionary researchers is sort of to explain this paradox. Uh, why should schizophrenia exist at all? Why hasn't evolution removed it? Uh, you cover various hypotheses in the chapter. Um, we definitely can't go through all of them now, but I, I thought it'd be interesting if you could list a few of the ones you find uh, most, most promising, most interesting. Yeah. You know, historically speaking, from my uh, personal perspective, I've long been interested in the question whether uh, social issues are central to uh, to schizophrenia. So I, I was very fond of um, an article published almost 20 years ago um, suggesting that, that schizophrenia could be a disorder of the so-called social brain. Um, 
by a colleague, uh, Dr. Burns from, from South Africa. And um, uh, back then I did a couple of studies into social cognitive abilities in people with schizophrenia and found indeed they were impaired in many aspects uh, concerning social cognition uh, and, and these impairments were even quite specific. So they were more, more pronounced in the social realm compared to other cognitive domains. Uh, but still over time, I found this explanation less and less convincing because uh, in my view, the social brain hypothesis did not resolve the paradox entirely. And uh, mm. in, in fact, I think there is no single one explanation uh, why schizophrenia is still prevalent uh, in, in uh, all populations and, and why this paradox really um, has not been resolved, I mean, not even in theory. So my, my latest, uh, or the latest idea that I'm most fond of is that um, it has in one way or the other to do with immunological issues. Right. Um, a problem with schizophrenia is of course the, um, the poorly defined phenotype that's I think uh, the major issue that hampers progress with regard to finding a cause for it. So uh, may maybe there is not just one cause, but many causes, but uh, I think the, uh, the evidence speaks in favor of something immunological going wrong in, in these conditions. Mm. And from an evolutionary perspective, uh, I find quite interesting the idea that in a broader sense of meaning this, the, the immunological problem could have to do with um, the uh, parasitic uh, affection by Toxoplasma gondii because that is also very prevalent worldwide. Um, so, Virtually billions of people have been infected with Toxoplasma gondii, but very few get sick from, from it. But uh, it seems to be the case that um, the number of patients with schizophrenia having the infection or at least uh, having antibodies against Toxoplasma gondii is apparently larger than uh, in the general population. So. Indeed, I, I also believe that several symptoms uh, more or less typically associated with schizophrenia could have to do with some kind of parasitic um, manipulation of, um, of patients' behavior infected with toxoplasma. But, but uh, that's another guess. Nothing has been proven so far. And... Uh, this is another hypothesis uh, that I think is worth being pursued scientifically, but as I said, nothing is nothing is uh, proven so far. Right. Um, yeah, it, it was interesting that you took the uh, the toxoplasma uh, gondi um, angle there. I think that's something that yeah, it's it's interesting to talk about, and and you also kind of. Relate it, and you, and you mentioned this this heterogeneity and the fact that there might be multiple causes, and and this is certainly something we see with autism as well. As you know, you have this very broad um, trait that you're trying to diagnose, and the way that a human might end up fitting into that category could be very different between different individuals. Um, you also mention uh, some more classic kind of evolutionary approaches. Um, such as like sexual selection for creativity in males and and that kind of uh, you know pushing some individuals towards uh, a kind of maybe subclinical schizophrenic phenotype or on the spectrum but then not actually expressing schizophrenia and then they can kind of go too far um 
yeah, it's uh, and and as you mentioned, there's there's many hypotheses. Uh, you 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 list maybe you know fifteen or so. Um, and it's, I think schizophrenia has been, or the paradox has been talked about since like the early uh, 20th century, since, you know, our, our kind of our first understanding of genetics. So, um, so yeah, and schizophrenia being so harmful, you can see why it would be so, so readily um, a target for evolutionary researchers. Uh, so, so I mean, an interesting uh, angle which you can take the the next question in in concentrating about on on toxoplasmosis um is thinking about how an evolutionary approach helps us in terms of prevention and treating um so so would the prediction be here that you know if we could somehow hunt down and um, and prevent these infections then you'd actually end up re relieving a lot of the burden of um of schizophrenia yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, um, let, let's assume for a moment that the, uh, for example, the, the Toxoplasma gondii story is true for a subset of people with schizophrenia, say just a, a tenth or a fifth of individuals with schizophrenia have that condition because they have uh, a toxoplasma infection or had a toxoplasma infection maybe already um, uh, during their fetal lives, um, then it could be worth looking at um, entirely different therapeutic strategies, including the development of perhaps um, new antibiotics rather than new antipsychotics which by the way has been a very futile endeavor in the last 20 or so years. But um, most antibiotics don't work very well against Toxoplasma gondii, especially in cases where the central nervous system is affected. And uh, probably if, if there is a latent infection, it, it, uh, it may not be the best strategy to try the uh, antibiotics that we have, but uh, the evolutionary perspective could provide it that the hypothesis is true for, for some people with schizophrenia could, could add to develop new therapeutic strategies for the condition. Interesting, yeah. And, and so if we were to start subtyping by these kind of evolutionary principles and maybe some individuals are um you know their psychosis is a reaction to kind of harsh social environments you know there are various hypotheses um about social environments and and then you know if you have infections on the one hand and then social environments and then you can kind of uh, identify subgroups that maybe would respond to different treatments or in, indeed preventative strategies uh yeah i mean yeah the, the psychosis spectrum is is very is large and and complicated um but uh but yeah hopefully we could we could go some of the way to to understanding it better and then and maybe this subtyping um is it's a good way to go about it you know like uh yeah stress induced psychosis and in brief psychotic disorders are also you know really common and, and psychosis in right. in response to um you know pregnancy or depression and and yeah it's um yeah it's it seems that the human mind sort of tends towards this this cluster of kind of delusions and hallucinations under various circumstances and yeah maybe maybe an evolutionary approach is the way to 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 best divide it up and then and, and do something about it um okay well thank you to for say something critical i don't think the evolutionary approach helps um subtyping oh okay uh at, at least not in terms of um, the, the phenotype, actually, if if, if you include immunological right. issues, then I then I would agree. But uh, just um, defining phenotypic subtypes by evolutionary principles or approaches, I think, is is not um, not a fruitful approach. Um, okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. But but. Okay, if, if you say we, we look at the broader phenotype, uh, we, we could speak about an extended phenotype, like, you know, Dawkins terms, where 
perhaps the parasitic manipulation is part of the extended phenotype, then I would agree that that would be would be good if we could um, add something uh, using an evolutionary approach to that. Okay, so even though the specific symptoms of uh, different psychotic disorders won't align nicely with particular evolutionary approaches, um, there might be separate evolutionary approaches within each of those kind of phenotypes, right? So, mm -hmm. so yeah, that's that's something interesting to think about, and obviously there's a lot of work to be done. Um, thank you for uh, talking through it with me today. Thank you for writing the chapter. Uh, your work thank on you. evolutionary psychiatry has really been excellent, and uh, yeah, some, some great resources. Anyone who's interested in the field should definitely check out um, your textbooks, especially, are excellent. So, thank you, Martin. Thank you very much, and thanks also for letting me contribute to your volume, and uh, I wish you the best of success with uh, the publication. <laughs>